Today I'm going to show you what's inside the steering column in your car and how it works. Now here we've got the entire steering column removed from the G35. Now some of the main components are of course the steering wheel, the airbag in the front here, the turn signal and wiper switches, the ignition switch here and the steering lock mechanism. We have the steering column itself which does have a tilt function and it connects down to the steering shaft which goes to the steering rack. Now I was going to start disassembling the steering column by removing the airbag. However it's held on by this weird Torx with a dot in the middle which I don't have a tool for so we're going to have to find other means to get in here. Now I'm just going to remove the turn signal switch and the wiper switch and save this one for another video on wipers. And now I can just remove this piece of plastic. Now that bolt is awfully close to the airbag inflator inside of there so I gotta be really careful as I grind off this bolt. And finally with those security screws out of the way I can remove the airbag from the steering column and then just disconnect this connection. Now behind that airbag we have a couple of wires here for the electronics and this nut here that I'm gonna remove that holds the steering wheel to the column. Just gonna thread on my special steering wheel puller here. And that'll knock the steering wheel free. Now the tilt mechanism is pretty straightforward. We have this bracket here that attaches the mounting points on the dashboard and adjusts its angle relative to the steering column through this little pivot slider over here. Now over on this side we have a threaded fastener with a nut that attaches to the adjustment arm. Now when this adjustment arm moves, it can only move between these two stopping points at its tightmost position. The frictional clamping forces in this pin here is what hold the steering column position. And I'll just remove this nut here. And as I unscrew this pin here, the arm on this side comes off and I can remove the central pin and you can see these here are the threads that adjust against the adjustment arm to give it that clamping force. Next up we come to the ignition cylinder lock and the steering lock. Now the steering lock is housed in behind this bracket here and there's this shear bolt here that holds it all together to make it harder for you to break in and steer the vehicle. We're going to use a special tool to get this off. Now the steering lock is basically this little plunger here that's activated by the key. Now as soon as I start turning the key to the first position you'll see that the steering lock disengages and that's going to allow the steering shaft to rotate freely. When you take the key out this will pop out and once you rotate the shaft to the correct position it's going to pop into this little hole here locking it in place preventing you from steering the vehicle. Now here we have the clock spring which is responsible for taking stationary wires mounted to the steering column and connecting them to the rotating steering wheel without these wires binding up. Now also housed within the clock spring is the cancellation system for the turn signals. Now the steering wheel straight position that notch is going to sit right over here and as soon as you turn the steering wheel in the opposite direction where you want to go it's going to self cancel. However if you turn it in the same direction it's not going to do anything and keep the turn signal on. So it's purely a mechanical self cancelling system. Now as an example when I install the turn signal into the clock spring and then I engage the right side turn signal the tooth on the centermost position here is supposed to cancel that turn signal when I'm turning in left so I'm going in this direction here however this one's a little bit weak and worn out and it's not actually working but if you look closely you can see the engagement of those two teeth inside of there. Now if I use a screwdriver you can see how it just self cancels and I can do it also in the opposite direction if I signal to the left and I turn to the right it cancels the signal. Now because these are made of plastic the little tabs in there do wear out and tend to skip the tongue so you lose that self cancelling function and you got to replace the whole clock spring assembly. It says don't drop and don't disassemble. You know exactly where this is headed. And I'm going to remove this part here which is actually a steering angle sensor which tells the ABS and stability control systems how to rotate the vehicle when you're moving or sliding. We're going to cover this in another ABS stability control system video. Now I'm going to attempt to open this clock spring. There we go. And that's what's inside the clock spring. You can see we have this long ribbon cable. It basically acts like a spiral and it turns inside of here as you turn the steering wheel. Now most steering wheels have about five turns of rotation. Now sometimes these cables can actually kink or completely get cut and that's going to cause an open circuit and your airbag and a horn not to work. Now both sides are made of this slippery plastic material to give it a little bit smoother action. Some of these are actually lubricated with grease. I'm surprised this one's actually really dry. Now here we have the combination switch and it's called that because we have the headlights here, fog lights, turn signals and the high beam back and forth. Of course we have this tongue that we mentioned earlier. This whole thing seems to be held together by these two screws here as well as a bunch of tabs. So I'm just going to start prying things open so we can see what's inside. And I'll just remove this backing and you can see we have a circuit board inside of here. And I'll just pry off this back plate over here. Now here we have the turn signal mechanism. Now this little tongue here sits inside of here and is slightly spring loaded. And it also sits inside of here and moves from side to side as you engage the turn signals from left to right. Now the actual clicking is 
caused by these two little points on either side. You can see that we have this little point over here that's spring-loaded and this little point here that's spring-loaded that ride up against this little cam profile on either side to click engage it on one side or the other side. Now I'm just going to remove this little end cap here and once I remove that this long piece comes out here. Then we have these two small little points here which are spring-loaded which is responsible for giving you that satisfying click when you turn this headlights on. Now if I reach in inside of here I can pop off from the fog light ring and you can see we have the other set of springs inside of here for the fog light ring to turn on and off. We have a tension spring here and then we have the actual contacts for the headlights inside of here and it has three different positions either off, auto, tail lights or full-on headlights. And I'm going to remove this ring here and you can see we only have two wires connected here despite it having a combination of different switch positions. Now the last part to the turn signal switch on the back here is this little tab that moves back and forth with the activation of the high beam. Now if I just try to crack off this motherboard here and you can see we have the circuit board itself and a couple of contacts inside of here. Now these contacts here ride up on the circuit board back and forth when you turn the turn signals on, up or down. Then we've got this smaller contact that moves back and forth with the high beam switch and this little high beam nub here engages with this plastic piece which has two contacts on the bottom. In the middle it's going to be set to off and if you move it to either side it will flash or keep the high beams on. Now as you can see the housing here is very well lubricated but things can still wear out especially these contacts here which you either have to come in and clean using your brother's old tooth brush or just get a new turn signal switch altogether. I'm just going to use a piece of my brother's old shirt here to wipe up this grease. Now back on the ignition switch on the top here we have the immobilizer module which has an inductive ring here and is responsible for reading the chip on your key and lifting the circuit board up. We have its connectors over here and these two wires here that go to the loop inside of here to inductively read your key. Now here I've got the original key and this little piece inside of here is the immobilizer chip in the key where it's going to be picked up by this inductor loop when you push it in. Now underneath here we have what looks like a key detection switch. When I push the key in initially you can see that this little flap here jumps up and that's what's going to cause the key reminder switch to engage and that's going to send a signal to the body control unit to play that annoying chime to remind you that you forgot the key in the ignition. Now on the back here we have the actual ignition switch which is a high current switch that is responsible for sending current directly to the starter motor. I'm just going to remove these two screws here and I can just pop that off and you can see there's just a little slot here where the key mechanism will engage and I can just use a screwdriver here to actually start the car if you ever wanted to hotwire. Now these are the contacts that have to touch each other when you rotate to cross these points and that's going to either complete the circuit between the accessory position, the off position or the start position. Now sometimes these contacts could wear out and you have a no start or an intermittent start condition and then you just have to come in here with your brother's old toothbrush and clean off these contacts. This actually only has four positions. We have the lock position, the first position is nothing, the second position is accessory, the third position is the on, and the fourth position is the start that's going to automatically return back to the on position. Now in the lock position I'm able to remove the key easily but as soon as I start turning the key I can't remove it anymore and that's basically a preventative measure to prevent me from removing the key while the vehicle is on. Now sitting inside of here there used to be a cable that came from the transmission selector and that would prevent this key from rotating into the lock position and you being able to take the key out unless if the vehicle is in park. Now in some key locks just to ensure you're the correct owner you insert the key and then turn it and then you're supposed to press down on these two little tabs here on either side and release the tumbler but in my case it seems really stuck in there so I'm going to have to use another tool to get that off. And I can remove the ignition cylinder. If I remove this front face plate here and then we have the key tumbler inside of here. When I push the key in you can see that I'm able to rotate it and I'm also able to pull the whole thing out. We have this tumbler on the outside here that holds everything and then we have these little tabs here that are spring-loaded. Now these tabs here correspond to the little bumps on here and when you push this in you'll notice that all of these tabs here get locked together and are now flush with the body of the tumbler and are free to rotate inside of the housing. Now looking at the tumbler inside of the housing we have these two key slots on either side and that's what prevents this from rotating. Now when I push the key all the way in those tabs have now sucked in and I'm able to rotate this and pull it out. Of course when I pull the key back out you'll see that these tabs will pop back out and that's what locks it against the case over here. Now if I pull out one of these tabs here you can see that we have a little tiny return spring and we have this little slot 
Now these slots have different locations and orientations within the key tumbler and that combination is what forms the security function of this key. And of course you can pull out all of these little tabs here and re-key the cylinder by rearranging it so that it matches the correct key that you want it to work with. Now inside of the steering lock we have this other piece here, the back of which connects to the ignition switch. Now if you look inside of the steering lock there you can see the mechanism move as I push the plunger in. And the tumbler extension here has this little fat piece which when it rotates it will actually hit up against the key lock here and push this in allowing you to steer the vehicle. Now it would be pretty tough to try to break the steering lock because you have to go up against this tab here or this tab in the steering column. Now next up we have the steering column itself which has this housing that mounts to the dashboard. We have the shaft inside here and a universal joint before it goes out to the intermediate steering shaft. Now by removing this nut here I can then push the steering shaft out of this collar here. Now this section collapses by force during a collision in order to prevent any collision forces from heading up through the steering column and punching you in the chest. Now this shaft is inserted into this other shaft and it has two small plastic rivets here. Whatever force it takes to break those, the shaft will then push itself in. And to demonstrate that, I'm going to give it a tap with a hammer. You can see how the shaft has collapsed. Now on the bottom section of the steering now on the bottom section of the intermediate steering shaft we have this universal joint and that's to prevent any binding and allow the steering column to tilt. We've also got this rubber bushing inside of here called the steering dampener and that's to prevent any vibrations from traveling from the steering system up into the steering wheel. To pull this off, it's actually made of plastic which is a bit weird but I guess it helps to dampen vibrations but it also becomes a snap point I guess if your steering actually like you know snaps out of your hand in a collision or something. Now the steering wheel frame is made of metal and it's got this spline on the inside there to interface with the steering shaft. The outside of it is just wrapped in leather then we have this squishy soft touch material with the frame inside. Now to get a better look I'm just going to cut the steering wheel open. And you can see what's inside the steering wheel. I would have thought it's a circular cross section but it's actually a W shape that goes all the way around the steering wheel and at the bolsters it just thicken up the rubber part it's not actually thicker in the metal itself. At least now I have a no top steering wheel for sports steering. And that's pretty much all the components that are going to making the steering column work in your car. Now you tell me in the comment section down below what do you think I should do with the airbags on this car. Should I blow them up or should I make a little science experiment. Make sure you follow me on Instagram for more behind the scenes footage and subscribe for more videos just like this one.